to get this right. The question was, um, we're, we have people who are very polarized, both sides pointing the finger at each other. Um, what would you do to bring centrists in? What would you do to reach out to those remaining Republicans? And what kinds of compromises would you be willing to make to do it? Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. Now let me tell you why I want to push back at the question. The vast majority of non-reliable Democratic voters today are not centrists. That is a fallacy. And I know because this is what I heard over and over and over again when I ran in Orange County. You have to be a moderate. You can't support Medicare for all. You have to support business. You have to take the corporate PAC checks. You can't be willing. The reason people are not Democrats today is not that they are with the Republicans on values or that some days they feel like you know, LGBTQ people should be shamed and other days they feel like they should be protected. They're, they're not having that kind of, there's no center on that, right? It's that they're disaffected. It's that they look at both parties and they say, I don't see myself in either party. I don't see people doing things to clean up government in either party. I gave the example of congressional stock trading earlier, but I could give others, corporate PAC money being another one, acting on gun violence prevention. Um, so I think the solution here is to be more frank and address at their core why people don't trust Democrats. In other words, why does somebody who's very progressive and very liberal in many, many, many ways and shares a lot of values check the box to be a no party preference voter? That is the fastest growing political party in the United States. No party preference. And how are we going to keep those voters? How are we going to stay connected to those voters? And those voters are disproportionately younger and browner. And they are our future majority. So I think that's one huge part. The second thing I would say is stronger message on the economy. And that is something where Democrats really need to get better. President Biden has a lot of good economic news. And he decides to name this after himself. Never name an economic movement after yourself, okay? I didn't like Reaganomics. I, I like the actual binomics, but don't name this stuff after yourself. Instead, talk to people about what this means. And he, when he does this, he's actually really good, I think. He says, you know, a lot of people are able to are getting paid a little more than they used to be, or have moved up in jobs, or gotten promoted, or a lot of people are able, because of that little extra money at the, at the wage, not to let go of that second job. And we have more work to do, but that's what I've delivered to you as president. So I have never met the voter, young, old, white, brown, black, urban, rural, suburban, never, who wants a bad economy. Nobody's ever said, what are you gonna do to take the economy? Nobody wants that. But we don't talk about economic problems as Democrats. We see this to the party that's bad at it. That's nuts. <laughs> we are the party that delivers the investments that create a strong, stable, globally competitive economy. And by God, we should win the voters on that issue. There was a study recently, 90% of Democratic messaging is about something other than the economy. Yeah. 90% of messaging, press releases, social media speeches, is about something other than the number one issue that every voter agrees on. So for me, it's, it's not, I, I've never felt like, oh, how am I gonna compromise? That, that's, I don't ever face that. I do sometimes feel like I can't get Washington to see who they represent. Right, And so for me, one of the most remarkable parts about this job, and this is actually probably a good place to close, is um, I go to the grocery store a lot. <laughs> like, my children, I just had a, a new babysitter who was with me today, and I'm flying to Boston tomorrow and then to D.C., and I was showing the babysitter what he's going to be making. Okay, Here's your cranberry chicken, here's your you know, recipe, here's your taco soup. And he, he's a single kid, he goes to Davis, and he says... Do your children like eat a lot? And I was like, yes. Like one's a water polo player and the other two are teenage boys. Like, yes. <laughs> but every time I go in the grocery store, which is sometimes more than once a day, I'm not going to lie, people will stop me and say, I can't believe you're here. How else would I get food? <laughs> but the fact that they are surprised about that says an awful lot about Washington. 
and how we connect to people and what our elected officials are like. And that is part of the gap that people have, not part of that trust gap, part of that engagement gap. This election for President Biden is not a persuasion election. It is a turnout election. Yeah. That is the problem. That's the problem he faces. Like they said before, if you haven't figured out Trump is a schmuck at this point. I mean, you're not, you're not gonna be like, you know what, it's the 19th indictment that did it for me. 19, 19 indictments is like one indictment too many. Nobody is going to say that. But there are a lot of people who say, I don't know, I don't know, like, who excites me in the Democratic Party? Who's gonna change Washington? Who's seeing the problems that we're really seeing in our lives? That's what this election is about at the Senate level, because it's about setting the stage for a durable Democratic majority for years to come. That's why I'm running, and that's what I want to deliver for you. Thank you all so much.